I wondered how many people in the, um, in the audience here this morning, how many of you actually are directly involved in working with call centers as opposed to consultants? Number of people actually working in call centers? Oh, so we've got quite a good, um, quite a good group on the reality side. What I wanted to talk about this morning is something that I'm sure you've heard often enough, and that is about the importance of a happy CSR, a customer services representative, to the well-being and the profitability of the call center. Now, I'm not going to go on about treating call centers as profit centers rather than cost centers and all the advantages. I could if you wanted me to. I'm going to focus quite narrowly on the psychology of what happens inside a CSR's head when they experience stress and the impact that it can have on various aspects of your business. I'd like to keep the session interactive if I can. So if anybody has any comments, um, feel free to stop me. Uh, we don't actually have to stop exactly at the end time. I'm going to aim for us to end at 11.30. But if you have questions, if you want to argue with me, I don't claim to know the answers to all of this. What I'm going to put forward is some ideas for those of you who are in management about how you can improve the effectiveness of call center operations by understanding something about the psychology of call center representatives. So where do I come from in this whole thing? You wouldn't have guessed, but I'm South African. I used to be a musician once, one hit, don't ask. Uh, I worked as a professional musician, uh, followed by uh, Accenture as a consultant. I did a technology startup in the um, 90s, as everybody else was doing in those days. And today I work mainly helping companies improve performance in various areas. So it might be sales, it might be workforce, um, and we look at the factors that improve those, and we actually use hard statistics to try and work out which factors are having the greatest impact on performance. Now that's quite an important point. What I'm saying is that although we've all worked in an industry for a long time, we develop a kind of a gut feel about what is and what isn't important. What I like to do is to try and find a way of measuring that and seeing is it really important. And one of the factors that is only now starting to be studied is measuring what CSRs feel inside and the experiences they have and what impact is that having on the organization. So we're moving from a kind of an art into a science and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So yesterday, organizations and businesses. I reckon there are a couple of people in here who are at least um, a couple of years younger than me but who will remember having worked in business many years ago. It used to be that emotions were something that you did not talk about at work, especially in England, but even in South Africa and everywhere else. Emotions were something that got discussed when it went wrong. This employee was angry, this person had a problem, this manager is not doing that. Emotions were not part of the job scene. And so we ignored anything to do with those. We damped down the emotions of people. Where have we come to in 2008? Today, our marketing tells us that we, Company X, differentiate on the quality of our people. Not only do we differentiate on the quality of our people, but if we run a customer services business, we differentiate on the emotional quality of our people. We will manage your emotions better than them. Coke manages your emotions better than Pepsi. Pepsi manages your emotions better than Coke. So from a world where emotion was not part of business, it was the opposite of being rational, emotions are now a core part of business today. So we are paying our frontline people, and I suspect some of the people behind the scenes, to love the customer. 
We are paying them to show the customer not only how much we love them, but to behave in such a way that the customer feels it. To manage the angry emotion of the customer whose balance is not right. To meet the needs of the customers and to satisfy them. So would most people agree that have been in business for at least 10 or 20 years, am I the only one or have other people felt the shift towards bringing emotion into the workplace, something we just didn't have 20 years ago? Yeah? Okay. So, what impact does this have on our employees? We know that there's a concept in psychology called emotional contagion. So it's like contagious, a disease, a virus. Emotional contagion means that people tend to pick up emotions that they experience from other people. By the way, if anybody wants a copy of the presentation, it'll either be made available from here or you can get one from me. Emotional contagion is where you pick up someone else's emotions. So here you have a loud South African in front of you going on about emotions and quite enthusiastic, clearly passionate about what he does. And slowly as the session goes on, you're either going to leave or you're going to say, oh, this is quite exciting and quite interesting. We could use some of this in the work. So it is with your CSRs when they're on, when they're on the phone. The more enthusiastic, the happier they f sound. So the caller will start contagiously picking up the same kind of emotions and that's why we encourage our people to show positive emotions because we believe in emotional contagion. But negative emotions are equally catchy and they have the opposite effect on the customer. So how do we keep this positive emotion thing running all the way through? The first thing we do is we create something called display rules for our frontline people. Does anybody actually call them display rules or we just call them standards of behavior in the organization? Is there a particular term? Okay. Display rules are the either formally written down rules or the informal unconscious rules that we give to people and saying this is how you need to behave if you are a member of XYZ Bank. You need to be courteous, you need to be warm, you need to be enthusiastic, you need to be positive. That is how we measure success in your interactions with the customers, in addition to talk time, rap time, and all the other KPIs that you better be managing underneath while this is happening. So you've got this level of emotional work, and you've got what I call the display rules. It's getting specific about how to love and satisfy the callers. So not only are we bringing emotion into business nowadays, we are saying you will pay you to love. Now there are a couple of professions where people are paid to simulate love. I'm not sure that call centers is in the same kind of bracket or any frontline work is, certainly mine is. I love my audiences. So what do you do? You've got a set of display rules. What do you do when you have to be cheerful to a customer, but you are not feeling cheerful yourself that day. There have got to be a few people in the room who have experienced that at some point. Anyone who is in sales, anyone who is in management, if you're managing a team and you're feeling really, really bad, and somebody walks in with a problem or they haven't done a job, then you can it's, it's tough. What is the effect? of that on you, so okay, we've managed to move it away from CSRs to all of us have this problem because we all have to have display rules in our work. Have you ever seen a cheerful undertaker and how long his business lasts? Not very long. You see, in order to keep the business going, there are a set of rules that you have to go with. So in order to understand the impact of behaving something that you're not feeling, we look at the difference of something called felt emotions and displayed emotions. Felt emotion is what you are actually feeling inside at any moment in time. The displayed emotion is what everybody is looking at when they see you. And the first rule, it took me a while to learn this in life generally, is that the emotion that you see is not necessarily the emotion that is going on inside the person. I wish I'd understood that at my first performance review. 
I had this really cheerful face and I thought, oh, I've done so well. And then they sliced me into little pieces. So the first point to get is there is displayed emotion and there's felt emotion. When you're not feeling cheerful and somebody calls in with a problem, you have two choices. You can either do something called surface acting or you can do something called deep acting. Surface acting is about modifying your behaviors to suit the display rules without trying to do anything about the inner feelings, about the felt emotion. So surface acting is acting. You're on stage, like me. Deep acting is to say, I'm going to try and feel what it really is that I'm supposed to be feeling for the display behaviors. So the one is about changing how you feel so that you're being genuine when you talk to the customer. And the other one is just changing your behaviors on the, fish, on the phone and trying to sound like you feel like you're supposed to, to please your supervisor primarily and to get the right kind of appraisals. It's interesting, by the way, a good study in 1998 shows that customers can detect surface acting, just as a matter of interest, customers can detect surface acting 75% of the time, and they don't like it. So if service quality is something that's an important metric in your organization, you need to start thinking about whether service acting actually does the job or whether it's doing it. So those are the two concepts, surface acting, deep acting. The problem with service acting, and this comes down to the psychology of the CSR, the problem with surface acting is that it creates a term called dissonance. Has anybody studied psychology that you'll know about cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is where it started. This is emotional dissonance. Cognitive dissonance in, in psychology is a concept that says human beings, and probably most organisms, find it very difficult to hold two different attitudes or two different behaviors or one attitude and one different behavior inside themselves. So it's very difficult to say, I am going to, I really love Gordon Brown, but I'm not going to vote for him in the next election. That causes stress when you think one thing, but you're doing another. And most of us have these kind of double standards in society all the time. We're always saying, oh, better education for the kids, need to eat healthy and then do another McDonald's, whatever. In all of our lives, you'll see that we have a reasonable degree of cognitive dissonance, thinking dissonance. In the call center, what we're experiencing is that we've given the CSRs a set of display rules, and they have now chosen to either surface act or to deep act. Those that are surface acting have got an enormous emotional dissonance between what they're feeling and between how they're behaving, the behavior that they're displaying. And that kind of mismatch leads to overload and exhaustion. And I'll show you exactly the kinds of effects that we have. The example that I thought was a, a good story, and um, forgive me if any of you have heard this, and it wasn't exactly a call center example, but I think it applies to this. A British Airways executive was on a flight to Australia. Is anybody from BA here this morning? Good. A British Airways executive was on a flight to Australia. And about an hour into the flight, said to the attendant, can I have a smile, please? And the attendant pushed her tray aside and said, um, sure. She said, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you smile first, I'll smile next. Fair enough. And so he gave her a winning smile. And she said, great, now freeze and hold that for the next 15 hours. You see, and this is the impact of saying to somebody, you need to hold a display behavior for any time. It really gets emotionally exhausting. And then we start asking questions like, why is the turnover so high amongst CSRs? Why do we experience resistance? Why are some people always off for 30% of the time? They are rebels, we didn't recruit well, we are not rewarding well. No, it's just the exhaustion of surface acting 
versus what you're feeling. Now, is that the end of the story? I hope not. Graphically, this is a classic graph. The graph says that when pressure on human beings increases, stress, performance does this. We all need a certain level of stress just to survive. So if there's no stress, you hibernate like a bear or like a squirrel. That's called hypostress. You then get up to a point where you are running with a peak amount of stimulus. I won't use the word stress. Without any stimulus, there's no performance. Stimulus increases, increases, increases until you get to the point of peak performance. And then as the stimulus continues, this is where it starts becoming stress and performance does a decline. We've known about this curve for the last 40 years. For those of you who do marathon running, those of you who are regularly in the office until 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night will know exactly what I talk about. What happens to people when they get to the right-hand edge of the curve? The kinds of things we see is that the immune system starts taking a dive. Suddenly you're getting colds all the time. What do you do? You go to gym and you work out harder. Because I'm working all of these long hours. No, that's more stress to an already overstressed body. So what you're doing is you're stressing out people. So now you start having days off because the, the, system, the, the stress is too high. You start having more absence. You start having emotional exhaustion. All of these are starting to cost in the workplace. And my point is that not only are you having to deal with the stress of the customer calling in and doing the display behavior, you're also having to deal with the stress of you putting on an act of surface acting when you're with people. So you are under double act for doing that. Now I'm not absolutely convinced that anyone has the answer to this yet. I think it's tough. I think voice recognition, I think web interaction are going to help in some way because it's easier, I suppose, to be surface acting. It doesn't matter as much when you're actually working on voice. But I believe that there are some techniques, and that's what we're going to look at now, for helping CSRs to deep act, to actually change their feelings to match the behavior so that they're not acting so that you don't have the dissonance. So that's the summary of the effect. Surface acting, you get the dissonance. That leads to the stress, leads to the burnout, high CSR turnover, poor performance, along with drug use, sleep disturbance, and alcohol. Just looking at that, I don't realize how much stress I must be under in my life. OK, so I did a little table here, of just looking at the different columns and seeing what the impacts on your people are. In terms of energy, surface acting consumes energy. Deep acting conserves energy. People actually feel great, I'm doing it. Good example is a doctor or a judge. You see, when they have to announce something, good news, bad news, whatever it is, because they are feeling congruent and they're feeling really satisfied what they're doing, they actually get a sense of job satisfaction. Even if it was a tough operation, even if it was tough news, there's a sense of job satisfaction in that work. Their display behavior is congruent with their felt emotion. So they are energized by it rather than de-energized by it. What is the effect of these two on on CSRs, exhaustion, burnout, resistance, you start getting people switching, if, switching into off a lot or not switching into on, lots of absence, whereas deep acting tends to motivate because of the success that you have. If you're deep acting and the customer is happy, that's a personal win for you, whereas when you're surface acting, is that really a win? I'm not convinced. And high engagement. How sustainable is surface acting? very unsustainable. You're likely to break role at some point when you're stressed and scream at the customer. You can fake it, but imagine what fakers could achieve. So that's, that's something that people say to me, is that I have in my call center people that fake it all the time. They sound great. They're schmoozing. You want to see what they do when they put the phone down, what they say about the caller, but they're faking. And I say, well, that's great. That person has got a particular ability and a lot of energy. Can you imagine 
how effective they would be if they were channeling that energy into some kind of deep acting and how much more you could be getting out of them. Effect on resilience, and we'll talk about that now, very low. It really lowers resilience surface acting. Deep acting makes it high. Service quality, as we discussed, tends to be poor because callers can detect it, whereas deep acting, you tend to have much higher customer satisfaction because there's no acting. The person is sincere and they are convincing. Finally, effects on job performance we spoke about low and high. So, how I want to close off here is just to look at a few areas about how we can improve resilience by encouraging deep acting in call centers and indeed in any frontline work. The first point here is to say you need to explicitly define meaningful display behaviors in your call center. If they're not explicitly defined, you're not going to get what you want out of your representatives. It's no good saying something as loose as be cheerful, be enthusiastic. People need to know how to behave. The most common mistake I have is assuming that all industries and sectors and callers expect the same kinds of display behaviors. Cheerfulness is not a good thing when you're phoning a very upmarket bank, for example. People phone in with a particular problem and they want that problem solved. Think about what does the customer expect in terms of behavior when you define your display behaviors. It's the easiest and most basic place to start. If you don't know, run a focus group. Customers, what kind of behaviors would you like from those? You can do it more scientifically. You can actually measure the behaviors of CSRs and then ask customers afterwards whether they were happy or not and see whether statistically it divides into groups. You'll soon be able to tell. But a much easier way, just ask customers what behaviors they want and start defining those. The next thing to have a look at is that, as everybody would know from kind of psychology 101, if you want a behavior to continue, in this case deep acting, you've got to reward it in some way. Human beings and any organisms, again, we need to be rewarded. If we're punished, we tend not to show the behavior. So what are we offering our people? How are we rewarding them for doing this difficult emotional management? What kind of rewards are on offer? Are we offering financial reward? A little break after a tough call? A career development path of some kind? How are we saying thank you for managing that customer's emotion and indeed for managing your own so that they'll want to do it again and again. Well, here's an interesting thing in terms of salary. Here's a study done in 2004 in the States. We really need one like this in the UK, which I think is fascinating. What it shows, in the top line, these are jobs that require high cognitive skills. The first rule is that salary in life depends on the level of cognitive ability, IQ, for want of a better word. Your salary primarily depends on IQ. These lower jobs here, they require, they are not as IQ or emotionally demanding as those. So these are, you start with physicists and astronomers with relatively low emotional labor demands, in those jobs. I've never met a physicist who's got a high emotional labor demand in their job, but maybe I could be proved wrong. And as the emotional demands get greater, somebody who's in a high cognitive job, their salary goes up and their wage goes up significantly. Now, let's look at jobs which have not got high cognitive content, but have got more emotional. So you start with those here, low skill, cognitive skill job, and you get a particular salary, and here's the bizarre thing, and I'd love it if somebody could explain this to me. The more the emotional labor and the more the emotional demands on your job, your salary actually goes down. Why? 
I, I mean, I'm genuinely asking, why? We are saying that customer satisfaction and customer management is so critical to the business. We spoke about the whole thing of contagion. We acknowledge those are critical jobs. Therefore, if we put our money where our mouth is, surely the more emotional work you're doing, the more you would be paying those people, not the less, to reward them, to say thank you, will you do more of that? Are we surprised if we're starting to pay less are we surprised at the burnout and the exhaustion and the attrition rates that we're getting in the centers? It would pay you to become a refuse handler or a roofer because they don't have to have all of the emotional exhaustion stuff and get home and kick the cat at the end of the day. So that's an interesting point for those of you who are managing call centers and frontline people to think about is are you rewarding the behaviors that you want to be increased? Recruitment and selection, I think, can have an impact on deep acting and building resilience. The first point is once you've defined those display behaviors we spoke about, recruit people who naturally display them. They'll have to try harder. They will be deep acting by the time they sit down at the chair and put the headphones on. If somebody has to be trained to display the particular behavior, they are going to be mostly surface acting. So recruitment can help a lot with that. Recruit people with a natural disposition. And pay more attention to something like emotional intelligence, if you're familiar with it, rather than personality traits. I'm on record at the British Psychological Society as saying that the study of personality should be banned. The only people it makes money for are people who create personality tests in this world. Their effect is so tiny. There is a consistent effect. That's why people con continue to do Myers-Briggs and the five factor in those tests. But if you try and measure what effect they have on something that matters, like customer satisfaction, on profitability, their effect is negligible. You're much better off looking at measures like emotional intelligence, and believe me, that's also quite small. If you're hoping that someone's got a high emotional intelligence score, that they're going to be your perfect CSR, they're not. There are other things you have to do, like reward them properly. But EI will take you a heck of a lot further than personality tests will ever do. So you can let your HR people know that. You clearly need to explain your brand values because they are part of your display behaviors. To the extent in your training, to the extent in your training that your CSRs understand why your company exists, how it intends to satisfy customers, it will make it easier for them to internalize those values and not have to act when they do it. So when I walk in to a call center, people are quite proud of the fact that they're acting. And I wonder why it is that when I walk into the operational level, people are really proud of their surface acting. But when I go up to a couple of management levels higher than that, people tell me how proud they are of the company values and how they are not just acting. Where has it gone wrong at the call center that they are acting and these people are engaged. So when you have your next climate survey and you measure employee engagement, engagement down here low, engagement up there high. I don't know why. I have a good guess why. I suspect that the person up here is being rewarded well for displaying a particular kind of behavior. And when you're being rewarded, you internalize the values of the company so you're not acting anymore. When a judge looks somber, when when she or he is sentencing someone to death, which they probably don't do much anymore, um, they mean it. And they learn to act that way because they are rewarded for it. Solicitors, doctors, they are really good and engaged. They are not acting because they are rewarded for it. But at the CSR level, there's acting. Only when you get to more senior levels in the call center of the management and around the rest of the organization do you get the deep acting and we need to work out why. So training, try and get the brand values internalized. Emotional intelligence training, 
I can't go into it, it's a session all on its own, but for those of you who've been through it, it's about self-awareness, self-management of your emotions, motivation in the face of adversity, empathizing with how others feel, social skills, managing the emotions of others, and learning to deep act um, like a good actor do. It's, it's method acting. There's training out there available for it to help your people become deep actors. If anybody wants to know more about that, do contact me and I'll put you onto it. It's not an area I do. I'm the analyst. But there are people who offer this deep acting which reduces the churn and the satisfaction of CSRs. Coming up the straight, roster, critical. We know that for stress, we know that you need two consecutive days off in order to perform without going down this curve. If your rosters are not offering two days consecutively, slowly, people slip down the curve. And the same with rest. After a particular call, a rough call, one of the most effective rewards you can offer to a CSR is to say, take half an hour. Don't worry about efficiency or uptime. Reward the person for managing what was a very difficult call. It comes back to reward. Finally, what can you do as a manager to help encourage deep acting within your people? One of the first things to do is the use of humor. Try and be light in certain situations with people. Don't make everything rough. Try to deliver KPIs, the positive ones first. A story I heard the other day, you can tell me whether it's common, somebody said that they got 95% customer service quality ratings for their calls for the past month. Now, I think that that's a good, is that a good score? I don't know, in the real world, I thought it was pretty good. What did the manager say, or the team leader in this case say to the person? What happened to the 5% that you didn't get? And you kind of think, wow, that's a reward. That's going to inspire me to move from 95 to 97. Common sense management. Train the first line managers to be first line managers. Train team leaders in the basics of motivation. Deliver the positive news first. It's the kind of stuff that we would have learned very early on in our careers. We expect people to come out of teams and to know the sort of thing because they were a great representative and a great operator. Being a great operator doesn't mean that you know how to manage them. Teach them the basics about reward positive behaviors. Appraise on positives first. Set an example. Managers should be setting an example by deep behavior and not acting out. And I see all too often in call centers that it's the team leaders who behave disgustingly. They're screaming and shouting at the very people that they should be calm and encouraging to be calm and empathetic to the callers. So set the example. So in summary, resilience, a very important and emerging field understanding the impact of stress on the CSR. So far we can explain the impact on absence, on high churn, and how to reduce it. As we understand today, there's still a lot to learn about deep acting and surface acting, but we've looked at a couple of principles which have worked and are known to help. So if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be delighted to take them. Thank you very much.